All right, and we are going to begin in a moment. Welcome to the Center for Global Enterprise, Global Scholars Expert Connect Series. <clears throat> My name is Ira Sager, and I am Vice President of Global Learning Initiatives for the Center for Global Enterprise, or CGE. We're excited to explore a new topic today, authentic inclusion. Our presenter, Francis West, is author of a new book, Authentic Inclusion Drives Disruptive Innovation. Over the next 60 minutes, Francis will illustrate how putting people first and building inclusion and diversity into business strategies will, um, I'm sorry, into uh, business strategies, uh, technology infrastructure, products and services, and organizational processes can help companies recruit talent, expand markets, and differentiate their business. Francis is an internationally recognized thought leader, speaker, and trailblazer for women in technology. She is known for her work in innovation, technology, and business transformation, and she is the founder of Francis West Co., a global strategic advisory company. Her approach comes from her wide-ranging experience as a global executive in sales, marketing, business development, and as in research, as well as her groundbreaking work as accessibility and accessibility as IBM's first Chief Accessibility Officer. But before we begin today's program, a few housekeeping notes, and we always do that for every Global Scholars program. For those of you new to the Center for Global Enterprise and our Global Scholars program, CGE is a nonprofit research institute focused on the study of global management best practices, modern corporation, economic integration, and their impact on society. Our Global Scholars Program is a worldwide learning community for business-interested students, academic faculty, and business professionals. Through Global Scholars, we offer online courses and digital internships, as well as this and other Expert Connect series. Participation in all our Global Scholar programs and membership is free. You can find out more information about our activities on the CGE website, www.thecge.net. Today's program will be recorded and is available on demand from the CG YouTube channel. We will leave approximately 15 minutes at the end for audience questions. If you have a question for our presenter at any time during the presentation, you can submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will try to get to all your questions, time permitting. It is my pleasure to turn you over to Francis, who for the next 30 to 40 minutes will propose new ways that business leaders can affect sustainable and scalable change and tap into tremendous opportunities by viewing inclusion as strategic and by addressing diversity proactively. Thank you. All right, Francis. Well, thank you, um, Ira, for this uh, great invitation. And uh, I'm really uh, excited to be here um, and to share with uh, the audience um, a topic that um, I actually wrote a book upon. Uh, authentic inclusion drives disruptive innovation. Um, I think everybody know that today, the topic of inclusion uh, is everywhere. Um, and every day when you open the uh, newspaper or the um, TV network, you, you hear people talk about inclusion. But my view of, uh, in this case of authentic inclusion, is uh, a different somewhat from the uh, quote unquote the um, uh, the current state of a talk. Um, my view of the inclusion in this case is not so much as an HR topic um, because usually when we talk about inclusion, people think about talent acquisition. For example, we want to have gender um, equality or um, really make sure that people who are underserved. Uh, by race, by religion, is included in the um, in the society. But my view is that uh, in today's world, it's not just a talent that we need to think about, but also technology. And the second thing about inclusion um, that, in my mind, that needs to be uh, talked about is that um, a lot of time we also um, pay attention to, like I said, gender, religion, or, or sexual orientation and background, but very rarely we think about, for example, people with disability or aging as a um, demographic audience that needs to be uh, thought about. Um, 
Ira, in your introduction, you talked about my role as IBM's uh, first chief accessibility officer. And the word um, chief accessibility officer means that we actually work on technology to make sure that the technology does not create barrier for uh, people with different disabilities or different abilities. So I feel very strongly that um, when we talk about inclusion in today's uh, world, we really have to think about technology and that is truly inclusive of all people beyond gender, race, and all that. But in, in some incidents, and actually in this particular case, with a very specific focus on learning from, for example, how to use technology to support people with disabilities so that we can create a understanding and a use case to build up, for example, in this in a workplace environment when employment can be rendered to everybody and create parity in productivity. So in, um, in this context, um, I wrote a book about authentic inclusion. Um, it is, like I mentioned, it's really focusing on inclusion in the technology context, but it also is very much an organization transformation topic. Um, I feel that in today's world, if we're talking about inclusion in a real sense, then we really have to think about the economic impact of inclusion. And the best thing we can do for any demographic or um, constituency, I call it, is to make sure that he, she, or uh, the person uh, with disability or with uh, aging abilities actually have equal access to employment opportunities. So if you read the definition, which is uh, on the slide, it says the institutional insight that human diversity is at the core of disruptive innovation. It calls for holistic actions across all parts of an institution to respect an individual's human's ability to make a difference, not in spite of, but because of their difference. And by putting human first, Prosperity can have longevity because principle, purpose, and profit are harmonious aligned. So the key word in this definition is, like I said, is that the human diversity is really at the core, especially in the innovation that we're talking about, not just today, but tomorrow. And I would take the audience through why I feel so strongly that inclusion has to be the base for our current and future innovation because it has significant impact on future work, future society, and future humanity. So why do I think that uh, inclusion, or want to move inclusion from a more of a HR perspective into a business imperative? There are actually many uh, drivers, uh, global drivers, causing um, the, the rethinking of um, inclusion from HR to business. One of the major trends that's happening is demographic. Um, for the audience um, on this webcast, I don't know whether you know, but um, according to the um, um, uh, United Nations studies, 15% of our population uh, has um, some kind of disabilities. So that translates to about 1.2 to 1.5 billion people on the planet Earth, which is about the equivalent size of the market of China. Um, everybody, of course, looked to China to have, you know, to, to expand their business and growth. But you think about it, there's 1.5 billion people um, naturally born with some kind of disabilities. And then about 60 to 70 percent of us, most likely in your lifetime, will encounter either accident, in, in some unfortunate cases, war, that will create disability as well. And then on top of that, you have aging population. When you age, you're naturally going to acquire disabilities, and therefore your ability to, for example, function is going to be different. Um, and in this case, technology can provide a tremendous uh, augmentation or assistance to people with different abilities to fully participate in the economic independence. So this is a one big reason why you know inclusion i mentioned earlier has to think about not just the person side the human side but also the technology side another major factor is the legislation um united states government actually is a leader uh in this um in this area in that uh, back in in the 1970s um united states signed the american disability act 
which really dictate that as a country, we want to make sure that the society and the workplace and business is uh, as inclusive as possible. So when it started out to be a very much a physical uh, kind of um, a focus, so for example, we all benefited from you know the uh, the the ramp you know to a building and elevators and all that those are all direct results of american disability act um but now that kind of a thinking is applying to the digital um uh, side as well so digital inclusion meaning making sure that your uh, technology infrastructure or internet infrastructure your web your mobile your iot your cloud is as accessible to all citizens is becoming a very key focus of all governments. Uh, leading again with the United States government, now we have, for example, the procurement law such as Section 508, meaning that if you are a startup or enterprise want to um, deliver your services to the federal government, you have to declare whether your product and services is as accessible as possible. Uh, and the European Union, for example, this year just passed the European Accessibility Act. And then you got countries like Canada, Australia, even China, all beginning to pass a similar um, kind of a, a legislation because as a, as a, I think as a society, and especially as a government policy level, they recognize that, again, technology is underpinning everything. So it is very important we have the right legislation uh, and in some countries actually beginning to have enforcement um, to make sure that um, the digital barrier is not accidentally created. Again, an example is the country of Japan. In the past that um, the Japan government has dictated that, you know, you need to make your product and services as uh, accessible. But some, you know, some companies chose to just pay the fine uh, if you, um, but you know, because sometimes it's maybe a little easier, you know, cost of doing business. Um, but but about a couple of years ago, the, the Japanese government had decided, no, we're not taking fines because that's too easy, you know, to to um, to get out. We want to see real hiring quotas and uh, uh, being um, uh, really exercised. And by the way, the U.S. Uh, has a Section 504 uh, law on the uh, uh, on the federal uh, contractor to um, in this case, to say that there should be an aspiring, uh, aspiring goal of a 7.5% of the employee base should be people with disabilities. So these are just a data point of indicator that, um, that there are about 177 countries around the world now have signed the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. So what that means is this 177 countries over the next year or decade is going to begin to institute policies and legislations that will really monitor, in some cases really enforce, that digital inclusion is really in place. So as a business, as all of us are out there, you know, thinking about today, but certainly plan for tomorrow, then this topic of um, digital inclusion or in authentic inclusion has to be top of mind. And another point is the social expectation. Uh, I think everybody recognized that as a society, um, we are really actually, it, it's a good thing that everybody is beginning to rise to the point where um, we want equality and not just in word, but in deed, in action, right? When there is when there is a disparity in equality, then you, you hear the voice coming out loud and clear. And social media can certainly create a channel for um, kind of um, uh, communicating the content. So if you are, again, as a business, it's very important your brand and reputation, your brand equity has to be mindful that you are there to serve I always say, when I talk to my customer, I always say, are you serving the little C customer or are you serving the big C? Because every customer or every business owner or executive will say, we want our customer or our employee to be, you know, um, um, uh, to be uh, satisfied or happy with our services. But if you truly believe that's the, the intent, then you have to think about that every one of us is very different and that have different wants and needs. And in this case, you really need to leverage technology to, you know, to support the quote unquote, the personalized uh, services and expectation of individuals. Um, 
and um, and which leads to the last point uh, on the on the global drivers is on technology. Um, we in the past twenty or thirty years we have seen a, a significant shift of technology from what I call the back office, you know, a system uh, a kind of optimization model, um, which is, what is where I started with IBM, you know, back in the late seventies and early eighties that we, we sell mainframe computers that drives processing in the back end, like for example, uh, banking, um, a check processing system. But now technology has evolved, you know, to the front end in that everybody's carrying technology, you know, for example, on their iPhone, in your pocket, right? So the technology now is moving to what we call the personalized experience um, era, that everybody wants everything to be individualized or personalized. So again, if you talk about personalization with technology, then one has to think about human, difference in humans and different of um, abilities. And again, and that's why I feel that, you know, having hu putting human first back in into in this kind of inclusion or technology discussion is, is a must do. Um, and I mentioned earlier that um, the, the technology is moving very quickly to a, um, in a world where everything is personalized. And, uh, and therefore, if you are either a startup or you are a, a established Fortune 500 companies, you really have to think about, you know, how do you service this very diverse, what I call the market of one now. In the old days, uh, if you study marketing, people would say, let's do a segmentation, right? We have the baby boomers, we have the millennials, we have the uh, Gen X, Gen Y. It usually is in these kind of a category, and then you design your marketing campaign, your product services to that segment. But we are moving to what I call market of one. In other words, very targeted selling. I mean, Amazon certainly uh, has, you know, kind of perfected or led in that revolution is that, you know, they customize based on the data analytic as to what you want, right? Or, what, or suggest what you perhaps need to read or need to buy. Um, and one can see very quickly we're going to evolve to a world of technology where everybody will want not just the content or the knowledge, but also the experience of the product to be highly personalized. So if you're going to address that kind of personalization, then the business executives, uh, it's, uh, and also uh, along with academia, really have to have a, a very strong awareness that we have to really teach ourselves and also our institution to really authentically, you know, respect not just diversity as a, as a uh, kind of a slogan, but really understand why diversity, um, how to leverage uh, diversity in a quote unquote action state so that it really helped to drive the innovation um, because without kind of diversity point of view, you will not be able to have the kind of innovation that really address the market of wine uh, phenomenon. So, so based on this kind of uh, um, kind of uh, overarching uh, drivers and also a perspective on diversity, um, I you know I, I spent a lot of time thinking about uh, what the technology future should should look like. Right again. Uh, like Ira mentioned, I worked in IBM Research uh, for uh, over a decade, and uh, so really had an opportunity to work with the brightest and the um, uh, the sharpest, you know, um, scientists and the researchers. And also uh, now working as uh, um, uh, you know a, a strategy advisory companies, I I spent a lot of time in the uh, you know in the Silicon Valley um, with the startups and also with think tanks. And again, coming back is that we are definitely seeing um, a movement to put human back in the center. And that because the technology is becoming such a way that the technology is becoming more human. And if the technology is becoming more human, then human has to become even more human in that we have to really understand what is the essence of the humanity and that using that knowledge to create the next generation of, of a society, next generation work. And there are already a lot of uh, work of the future studies coming out um, through McKinsey, through you know, um, 
um, uh, Ernst and EY, and and many of them talked about in the future the job is going to change, you know, uh, very quickly. But some of the um, what they call the soft skills, which is really the human skills, right? Empathy or creativities, um, things like hard to put in the box, but we all know is very essential. So as we move along the technology design or technology development or deployment or testing the entire process, we have to think about how do we actually put human back in to make sure that it doesn't either derail in just thinking like a machine or, um, or actually in, inadvertently creating bias. Another point that, um, that uh, I think that uh, we really should uh, uh, really kind of spend uh, time um, thinking over and also um, take action is that the, if you think about the technology, it, you know, especially the internet, you know, the original intent of the internet is, is actually is to create democracy, right? Everybody have access to information. So in a way, it's a very quintessential American idea, which is, you know, you know, whether it's the Bill of Rights or the U.S. Constitution really talked about, you know, we, every human being in this society have an equal opportunity and equal access. So I think for the companies, especially U.S., you know, companies, or even in this case, you know, um, companies around the world who really strive for the equality and quote unquote the democracy in, um, in human um, kind of a participation, then we have to think about, you know, the technology by designing human, by having human first kind of a thinking that we, we, we really create a technology for all the people and by the, all the people. And then at the same time, we are at a, I think, a inflection point uh, in the society because the technology in the past 20 years has certainly contributed to the, to the com convenience, the productivity, but, you know, it also has accelerated the society in pursuit of profit, right? Um, we have seen that uh, without balancing of a profit and a purpose or principle, that there could be a, a real imbalance of, um, of opportunities. And that, um, again, I think if we start really authentically thinking about the topic of inclusion, either in institution like business or academia, um, um, then we have to think about can we institute or begin to think about a new construct, a business construct that really put, you know, the profit and, and purpose, you know, in a, a more alignment or value alignment, right? Uh, Michael Porter um, actually uh, had a, um, a Harvard Business Review paper um, about 10 years ago. I talked about that um, basically capitalism as we know it today will not exist or cannot exist unless we have a better um, alignment of a shareholder value uh, against profit. I think we're at the point where we really have to think hard about, you know, perhaps it should be a new model. And that's why there is this um, idea in my book I talked about in the Silicon Valley, uh, um, there is this beginning thinking that maybe Fortune 500, which completely focus on profit, should begin to evolve into Impact 500 meaning it's not just about the profit, but what is the value you bring to the society and what is the purpose. Uh, by the way, um, just a, a data point, um, this kind of a concept, some may think, oh, well, this is a, too aspirational in this society today. You know, uh, Francis, you may be just kind of a dreamer, but um, this year at the World Economic Forum in Davos, for the first time, the topic of, um, of a disability or inclusion uh, made the list, so to speak, and then there is actually uh, a movement called Valuable 500, um, which actually asking key global, you know, 500 executives to uh, think about should this topic of inclusion, especially um, people with disability, um, is, it should be part of the board agenda, right? So this is, again, um, World Economic Forum, we, we all can recognize that they're kind of, um, um, you know, forward-looking, you know, uh, organization that everybody looked to to provide some kind of uh, a guidance as a future of the uh, development of the economy. Um, so for them to take on this topic this year, I think is significant. 
And the second point on return on innovation, um, you know, I mean, I've been in the business for 30 plus years and um, we, we all understand the return on investment is crucial, right? Uh, but as more, as I think about the topic, of especially talk, think about the work of the future, the society of the future, uh, I really feel like that perhaps we need to introduce another dimension, which is, you know, what I call the return on innovation. Because the innovation is something, it's, you know, in my view, um, it's almost like a research, you know, re usually innovation is tied to research. And sometimes that's a, a, high, a longer horizon, more than a quarter, right? And yet this is crucial because innovation that would impact us, impact all of us, business or a society, is worth spending the time, is worth to have that patience to think about. Because, um, you know, simply, you know, example is that, for example, we have seen the social media come about very, very quickly, you know, just within the past 10 years. You know, Facebook is so pervasive, everybody uses. And we really didn't think about, think ahead, you know, no fault of, you know, the Facebook founder or anything. They, you know, basically operated in a real time uh, and it was a great opportunity for this new technology to be introduced to society. But now we're beginning to see some of the impact, for example, cyberbullying and all that. So for every action, there is a reaction. Um, when we talk about how the technologies impact humanity or human, then we may want to stop and think about a little bit longer term and really have a little bit of patience and really have a more of a holistic stakeholder, you know, entirety or um, kind of um, uh, approach to thinking than just, you know, more of a, a kind of a single measurement of metrics of a profit or dollar cents. Um, so this actually leads to the crust um, of my, uh, my thinking and also uh, what my book is about is that I also feel that, you know, inclusion right now, in many cases, they talked about as a program, right? Like we have an inclusion or diversity inclusion program. But in my way of thinking, if we are to authentically, I mean, the key word is authentically, when I say authentically, meaning we really put our money where our mouth is, and that day in and day out, inclusion becomes a real reality of operational reality, right? Not an aspirational reality, but an operational reality, then we have to do it differently. So, you know, on this chart, I laid out, you know, there are action needs to be taken, for example, at the very top in the boardroom with the C-suites, the CEOs, and the board members. It's like, in your company or your institution's vision and your um, strategic imperatives is something like inclusion and diversity is included as part of your, you know, overarching, um, um, you know, important thing to do. Um, my career was with IBM and I can tell you that, you know, if you look back at history, you know, TJ Watson in this case, it was, you know, kind of declare that diversity is a key kind of a theme of IBM as a company. And today you look at, look at a Microsoft, you know, the CEO, um, he personally, you know, wrote a book about, you know, um, about this, uh, his own personal journey and the recognition of how diversity it is, how important it is. And, um, and so this is kind of an example of how, about this, the highest level leaders really going out and declaring that this is a strategic imperative and then the rest of the company actually build their product and services around it and again um, if you look at you know just recently uh, Microsoft has come out with for example gaming um, uh, gaming devices for Xbox that is uh, optimized for uh, children with disabilities what a great example of uh, operationalized you know um, kind of inclusion from the very top. And then research and innovation. Um, this is an area that, you know, we all have to be very conscious about inclusion. Um, I mean, there are definitely a lot of talk, for example, about artificial intelligence, AI fairness, uh, unconscious bias. Um, my hope is that, you know, uh, there are a lot, a lot of conferences and seminars in this kind of topic. Uh, the best way to do that is making sure that when you do, when you think about research and innovation, when you talk about gender biases, you actually have people that potentially will have, you know, 
um, be impacted, you know, negatively of these kind of a topic, be part of your, you know, research and innovation team. So again, in this case, what do I mean? I mean, if you're going to research AI for gender, um, you better make sure that, you know, a woman is part of your design thinking, right? Same thing with this technology. If you really want to have inclusion, then make sure you, for example, have, you know, people who are blind or deaf, you know, or cognitive challenge with autism as part of your research innovation team. Uh, don't involve them only as a user, for example, as a testing, but you really engage them at the very front end. Same thing with the product design and development. Um, again, this is, this is when you really operationalize your inclusion, right? I mean, there are steps that could be taken, um, especially on the design side, that um, could be um, very easily uh, implemented. But if it's not thought of ahead of time, it could create um, a real downstream uh, problem. Some of you probably noticed my chart is very simple, basically, um, you know, text and with uh, no picture. Why am I doing that? Because if there is a blind person is on, um, on this webinar, and it makes it very easy to, to uh, switch from text to speech for him or her to follow along. But if I use a lot of pictures, you know, for those of you who can see the pictures, you will get the context. But then for people who are low vision or who are blind, you know, they were lost out. So, um, and also you can see that the text font size is quite large and uh, it's not necessary for blind, it's for myself. I don't know, Ira, whether you agree or not, but uh, the font size as you get older, you know, matters. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> not to call you out about your aging challenge, but um, but this is a great example of how when you design for, for example, with uh, accessibility, mind you actually benefit everything. I always say mobile device like iPhone um, and, uh, you know, has really helped us to understand digital accessibility because the font size, the color contrast, for example, you're walking out in the sunlight, if the color contrast of your apps is not designed correctly, you can't see, right? So there are many, many nuances that for that human experience that could be brought in and that if you're gonna do a design workshop or do a customer journey, you know, make sure that you have people with the constituents that you really, really want to serve is included in that process. And marketing and sales, um, again, um, there is a tremendous brand um, kind of uh, equity and the differentiation can be had. Going back to the example of a Microsoft, uh, if you go back to watch their 2019 Super Bowl ad, you know, it's, it's all about, you know, children using this Xbox. And I can tell you, I think they were ran, uh, uh, ranked one of the top ads, uh, um, you know, Super Bowl because they're very expensive. So people always you know, want to see whether they get their return on their investment. But in this case, I think it's a great example of how the branding uh, is, is definitely there. And then you also, we also, in my book, I also talked about uh, Tommy Hilfiger, which is the fashion house. And they have designed a, um, a, a runway of dreams, a basically a series of uh, adaptive clothing. So for example, instead of having buttons, using Velcros. Right, so it's easy for um, for um, people with some um, uh, mobility challenge to put on their clothing, and but that works again for aging population as well. So there is marketing differentiation, and then there is direct sales um, benefits. And I think uh, McKinsey had done a report that um, the company that really you know operationalized you know kind of diversity on average you have like a 30% higher, you know, profit margin um, than people or than companies who are not. So we definitely can see the direct correlation between um, inclusion and profit. And then information technology, you know, the IT or the CIO office. I mean, to me, this is actually one of the foundational play that um, in today's world, a lot, when you talk about inclusion, I actually did a research when I first, um, you know, I, did, I just typed in the Google the, the Google the word inclusion and CIO. Unfortunately, there aren't that many hit. Like when you type in inclusion, you, you hit HR, you know, human resources and lot. But CIO, CTO, not so much. But to me, again, if you're going to be authentically 
a company that wants to hire people with different abilities, then you better make sure your workplace infrastructure is accessible um, and that you have the right technology accommodation uh, to do that. Again, today's um, webinar, uh, I hope that you know, we'll have a chance to have a uh, caption, right? Because this is, again, it adds to the value that people of different language capabilities or, um, or just in general, you know, wanting to hear the, uh, what I have to say versus you know, watching, watching me. Um, those are kind of little things that technologists like the CIO and CTO can put into their, um, their organization and to make the differentiation and also make it a truly inclusive. Uh, last but not the least, the HR um, organization or legal, you know, I mean, legal in the sense that and they are, like I mentioned earlier, there are laws on the books and you actually don't want to be um, sued, for example, uh, for creating uh, digital barriers. Um, the famous case of a target back in, uh, I think, uh, 2006 was that a Berkeley uh, student uh, who's blind would like to do online shopping to target as the school year was about to begin and the target uh, website was not accessible. So um, in the end, they settled the case, but that became like a landmark case because the debate was that uh, with ADA or American Disability Act uh, declaration, uh, is internet a marketplace, right? So the, 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 the debate between the uh, defense and the plaintiff is that Okay, ADA's declaration only applied to physical building, and here we are talking about a, you know, virtual, um, virtual access. So therefore, it should not apply. But in this case, the the judge in California upheld the uh, the, the lawsuit and say no, you know, uh, internet is a marketplace, and therefore the you know the same kind of um, a thinking should apply. So again, working with HR and the corporate functions. But the key point on this is that we really, in order to be authentically inclusive, it has to be a holistic 360 degree operation um, to make, uh, make a play, uh, to make it um, real. Now, the, you know, so, so the inclusion topic, uh, again, in many cases is about, you know, um, one, one uh, constituency, whether it's in this case it could be women's group or um, uh, or a re different religious background group, or in in my uh, most um, kind of uh, the place where I spend most of the time, and people with disability talk about inclusion. But fundamentally, we each individual had the responsibility and has the opportunity to be, you know, inclusive, right? I mean, in other words, the individual have to take action to reach out, in my case, as a first generation, non-English speaking, female in technology. Uh, in my early 20s, I was actually working in Michigan, in middle of the state of Michigan. And, and frankly, at that time, it was completely all white male, right? And it was upon me to really, you know, do my due diligence and do my work to really reach out to connect with my customer base, and in return, we created you know kind of a very um, uh, you know prosperous you know win-win relationship. So I think the responsibility of inclusion actually start with the individual, but then in an organization context, uh, which is what I'm talking about, authentic inclusion. You know, as line managers, you actually have very um, important roles because your hiring decision can create diversity or not, right? And I always jokingly said that, you know, because, um, you know, LinkedIn, for example, uh, sent you all kinds of uh, um, job posting or examples and all that. Every time when I hear the word cultural fit, I just shudder a little bit because cultural fit means that you're looking for people that, you know, fits your culture, but by definition, potentially, you're excluding people with a different point of view. So I think the line manager actually holds a lot of key to making sure that the organization is is truly uh, diverse or not. And then the executives, right? You actually own the own the resources, you own the money, frankly, and um, and and people. So again, going back to my uh, earlier chart, 
is this part of your organization uh, imperative or strategic imperative? It is very important. Again, there was a, um, a research done that um, in today's world, it talked about changing, um, uh, changing um, uh, kind of a social expectation. Uh, Deloitte did a research and they, they actually found that 39%, close to 40% of um, kind of a, a, a millennial or younger generation say that they will leave an organization if they feel that they are not really truly inclusive in their value in their leadership. So that's 40%. So the retention of talent could be a big issue if you're at the executive level is not, you know, uh, walk, talk the talk, you, you can talk the talk, but you gotta walk the talk. And finally, last but not the least is organization. Um, there has to be governance and policies and also measurement metrics put in place um, because like I mentioned, I really believe inclusion should be viewed as a business imperative. And every business imperative, you know, cannot succeed or cannot sustain and cannot scale unless you have metrics. So organization policies and governance is just as important because that create the framework to, for sustainability. So, so my bottom line kind of a thinking and also the message to um, to customers that uh, uh, I advise is that you really, if you want sustained profitability, you know, um, then you really have to, in this world, especially going forward, um, today's, you have to think about the principle and purpose alignment in addition um, to just profit. But if you do principle, meaning that your, um, your decree and your ethos of your company um, is truly you know, authentic, and then you can clearly articulate your purpose, then the profit will come along. Again, um, Steve Jobs gave a very uh, good um, um, speech at MIT's uh, graduation in um, 2017. He talked about he actually was kind of a bit of a wandering soul until he he you know ended up in in Apple um, not Steve Jobs I'm saying Tim Cook I'm sorry Tim Cook <laughs> Tim Cook until he until he went into Apple and then he found purpose you know in the sense that you know in this case you know um, Apple's um, kind of whole goal is to uh, to make the technology simple and easy to use by everybody. And that how that really motivated him to continue to transform the company and drive himself, you know, to to the next height. So I think that this kind of a value uh, alignment, especially in today's world, is is more than um, ever being important. Um, and then if we do all these, if we truly um, not just believe, but we actually operationalize inclusion, then talent acquisition, business differentiation and especially market expansion. Um, I, earlier I mentioned, you know, there is um, 1.3 uh, billion people uh, in this world. I mean, associate, you know, uh, disposable income is $8 trillion, right? So there is everybody in business talk about the green field or the white space. There is a huge space could be had if we uh, if we begin to design in you know inclusion, then your product and service can reach all the market. And uh, again, I will give you one last example. Like country of China is actually taking, for example, the digital inclusion very seriously. Now they don't have American Disability Act, right? But they realize that um, one of their um, financial a company and financial. Uh, which is a mobile payment system, when they came out with a mobile app, it was not accessible to a blind um, consumers. So a couple of consumer ex, um, complained, they immediately decided to hire a blind people um, to join their design team because they realized there's opportunity um, to be had. So they were actually invited to speak at UN um, just uh, this um, uh, earlier this year about their uh, journey on uh, accessibility or on, um, you know, on uh, disability inclusion. So this phenomenon is not a theoretical or feel good kind of a charity, philanthropy kind of a topic, which by the way, a lot of times when you talk about accessibility or disability, people immediately like, 
oh yes, I will donate. No, this is not a charity play. This is a business imperative play. Why now? Our future work, future society, and frankly, the humanity depends on that we now really authentically introduce not just the thinking, but operational principle into our day-to-day um, -day, um, execution of our business plan. And uh, it's only, in my view, way of thinking is that if we have that kind of alignment of putting human back as a human first, that we can truly affect the society at large and that making sure the next generation of technology, whether it's Internet of Things, especially artificial intelligence or VR, AR, um, all have a people as, as, the, as the center of the purpose of the technology. So my last chart is that people say, well, why do you feel so strongly about this topic? And um, like I mentioned, um, you know, I, I hope that um, people realize that I, in my case, I, I had a very a good career uh, in IBM, but my last job as a chief assistant officer was the most fulfilling job and I decided to major on this. So I put the money where my mouth is. Basically, I bet my own career on it. And they all come back to, um, I think going back to way back when I was growing up in Taiwan uh, as a Chinese a student, we were taught this uh, Confucius idea of the great way. The great way means that it's a society where there's actually a place for everyone. So in a way, it is a inclusion of all kind of a thinking that kind of, um, is part of my my being because I'm talking about human first topic, and that and it is my hope that uh, um, through my years of uh, working and um, now have opportunity to you know provide you know uh, speaking and also engagement opportunity like this that the digital uh, promise um, can be delivered to um, to all people around the world. So with that, I think um, we have about. 15 minutes left. Uh, I'm going to turn the uh, podium back to Ira. Thank you, Francis, and uh, great conversation. I want to remind people before uh, we get into the questions that if you do have a question, you want to submit it right now, use the Q&A feature or the, uh, the chat box, whichever one is more comfortable. Uh, and we will start with a uh, question from another Francis who wants to know, um, and I guess your question is, we know that serving poor people is always expensive for businesses, which most times forces many to create a niche or uh, focus on markets with capacity to pay. How can this be addressed when building, develop, or developing an inclusive innovation? Well, I think the, um, the cost of, uh, if you, cost of serving uh, can come down, Again, if you look at the common needs and wants of the uh, of the people, right? So, the niche product uh, became niche because there is not an awareness that some of the uh, application can be broad uh, can be broad based. And this is an example, you know, in the accessibility world, a lot of time we, we we heard about the curb cut, right? The curb cut through the uh, um, American Disability Act. People view that as very uh, expensive. That when you when you build a street, you have to build a curb cut, you know, uh, extra. But then what they realize is once you have the curb cut um, built, you know, most people who use that are not people in wheelchair. It's, it's a bicyclist, right? Or people with a stroller, or business people lugging their luggage, you know, in New York City, right? So again, I think part of it is really having the foresight to recognize that every time when you say, well, this is this expensive, are you, looking at the, are you looking at the solution broadly enough? Are you bringing other people to actually help you think the application of that product or services and how it can be universally uh, applied? So I think, I think that broadening the, uh, the, on the business side, broadening the perspective of the use, use case is actually very important. That's why one of the things I'm really pushing for is that we need to have the diversity of inclusion in the front end, the design phase of any company's endeavor. Because otherwise, you pigeonhole your, yourself into a thinking very narrowly, and therefore, by definition, the cost of, cost of goods is gonna be high. 
That's good. And, and actually, I have a follow-up question to that, Francis. Uh, and this gets back to where do you start? You know, what are the, you know, the practical ways to implement the principles that we're talking about here in a workplace? And you had mentioned that it needs to be a top-down. It needs to have board buy-in. But um, how does, uh, you know, how do managers in, ensure that their efforts are, you know, authentic? And, and where do they start? Is it at the design process? Well, I think the design certainly, but I think the, uh, it, again, it, it, uh, it's really, I believe that you kind of have to, um, you have to lead by example, right? Uh, we talked about brand equities and all, all that, but you really cannot be authentic unless you, for example, hire employee with diversity first and foremost. So a logical space to really operationalize, it, frankly, is your technology infrastructure, your workplace technology. So that definition actually, I mean, that responsibility actually usually is associated with a CIO or as a CTO. So uh, I guess I, I can I can uh, uh, share that in my work uh, when I took over the uh, accessibility organization. Actually, where I spend most of my time is is with the CIO office and trying to see how we can make sure that you know the all employees around the world uh, will have the kind of equal access. But the the key though is that the discussion with the CIO cannot again be a theoretical, right? I mean the in this case, we actually involved all our um, employees with different dis disabilities to be almost like our advisors and help prioritize, which is another thing. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, where do you start? I mean, you don't have unlimited resources, so you have to be able to prioritize. But the prioritization itself, it's, it can be a very good, again, uh, process to help to bring people together and help to make the decision. Um, uh, I get the decision buy-in. And, and good, because I think that's a follow-up question and sort of how do you get the buy-in for human first approach to business? And, and it sounds like that is the way to achieve uh, that sort of buy-in in, in the organization. Yeah, the buy-in, uh, uh, that's why I am doing a lot of uh, speaking and engagement is that fundamentally has that that, that vision and desire has to come from the very top. I mean, the process actually is, I won't say it's, it's not that hard. I mean, I mean, there are many examples you got, like I said, I mentioned a company like uh, Microsoft and you in financial services, you have Barclay Banks or JP Morgan Chase. Uh, many companies are beginning to be on this journey. So this is not a new topic, but, but if you don't have the very top understand really organically that this is not a um it's not just a you know kind of a chief diversity officer's job but it's his job to lead and that his job to 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 de declare that we want to hire diversity or making you know diversity talent as a part part of our number one and also our marketing campaign for example to our customers uh as our number one uh, priority then it, it, it will be more challenging yeah, and just to shift gears a little bit, Francis, you mentioned um, uh, some companies that you cited as good examples of addressing uh, authentic inclusion as a fundamental business uh, strategy and plan and not a uh, HR checklist. Uh, and uh, Microsoft, I think IBM. Uh, I'm just wondering if you have other companies that you would cite also. And you mentioned, of course, what China is doing. But uh, I think for the audience, if they could relate and, and touch, you know, I think it's easier if, they, if you could cite some other examples of companies or products and services where you see that happening in the marketplace. Well, I think, uh, uh, again, um, I mean, I mentioned IBM and Microsoft. These are like a super large companies, right? But then they are actually emerging um, companies, uh, small startups, right? I mean, IRA, A-I-R-A, uh, check them out, AIRA.io. Um, they have gotten, you know, more recognition in the past year or two than anybody else. I mean, it's a startup company based in San, San Diego. Uh, I'm, I'm very uh, um, actually honored to be an advisor to that company, but they created a, a wearable uh, device, um, a kind of a Google Glass um, equivalent to help uh, people um, navigate the world, uh, low vision and blind people to navigate the world. 
using wireless technology, using um, uh, what they call the agent-based uh, system. So basically a person will be in a foreign places, a, through the video feed, an agent will come on and will, will speak, you know, through the Bluetooth to the person and navigate, you know, around. And it's a, it's a great way of using, you know, cloud technology, artificial intelligence, wearable, you name it. Uh, and they are getting all kinds of recognition. So this is an example of how innovation that matters, right? Um, and then you have other company like, um, you know, like for example, in New York City, you have a studio analogous is a, a branding company. And now it's beginning to really focus on in inclusive branding, right? Because um, the CEO, um, they are recognized that um, this is a area that, you know, is not going to go away. So, so I think, for large company, even for startup companies, this kind of a human-centered uh, thinking and design is is beginning to uh, um, you know bubble up you know all around. Um, so I think I think for the audience, if you just begin to Google um, Google or just to um, uh, check on this topic, you will see that there is a lot of best practices and there's conferences coming up this year's uh, South by Southwest. Check out South by Southwest um, 2019. There's a whole accessibility and inclusion track, and you will see, you know, all the way from accessible city to, um, you know, a, uh, a blind chef. You know how she does cooking. Uh, there's many, many variety of companies are beginning to, you know, come into this space. Uh, and I think we have time for one more question, and uh, I'm going to go back to uh, what you said about your first job uh, with IBM, and uh, I guess it was a System 370 mainframe back in the day, and you were working in Michigan. And you dating had, me. <laughs> <laughs> and you had to connect with the, um, the classic white male um, environment in IT at the time. Uh, thankfully, things have changed. But I'm curious uh, for the audience, how did you connect with um, what I assume would be so different, uh, such different backgrounds? Right. So, yeah, it was in, uh, so my office was in Grand Rapids, Michigan, but all my accounts were in Muskegon, Michigan, and uh, a town near the Great Lakes region. And all my accounts were manufacturing, hardcore manufacturing accounts. Uh, like Teledyne Continental, they build tank engines. Um, so I will walk down the shop floor. I mean, uh, back then, you know, uh, IBMers, uh, at least women, you you wear you wear dresses. You know, you wear skirts. You never wear pants. There's no pants nation. You know, <laughs> even 25 degree below zero in dead of winter Michigan, you wear skirts and you walk through the shop floor, and um, and I remember, you know, and I was, you know, in my 20s, you know, how do you even engage? Uh, so I did some study and I re re realized that a lot of uh, my customers actually in Michigan in the wintertime, what do you do? You, there's nothing much you can do except ice fishing, right? So, so I read up a little bit about ice fishing. By the way, I grew up in, uh, in, in Taipei, in Hong Kong, you know, which is like a metropolitan area like New York City. I've never, never came, never fished in my life. But um, I always start my conversation asking my customer, you know, how's, how's the ice fishing going? You know, how do you do that? And, you know, I mean, um, and of course, always bring a big spy on their face and they will spend, you know, half the time telling me about their, their fishing experience. And that's how I connected as a, you know, we connected as a human base. And then I start to tell them that they need to upgrade their, you know, system 370, 145 computer from five, you know, um, uh, you know, 500 megabytes to, uh, you know, whatever, you know, the mainframe storage. So I think the connecting at the human first level is, is really the key for me, at least, to break down a lot of those barriers. Uh, but I would still say that those, those uh, experience back in Michigan days uh, really uh, taught me a lot about uh, personally how to operationalize inclusion. Oh, that's great. So you never went uh, ice fishing, I take it? Uh, no, no. <laughs> oh, but they, I do get the benefit of that. I mean, toward the end, every season, I will get smoked uh, steelheads or, you know, um, different kind of fish from my customer. Uh, uh, that's great. And, and, and Francis, I want to thank you for a, a great session and actually sharing your experience. And I think 
Uh, our attendees have learned a lot. I want to hold up a copy of, of your book and tell people that if they're interested, it's available uh, online and through your website and also obviously uh, through Amazon. And I uh, recommend it heartily. Uh, again, thank you for your time and I think helping our audience to understand this topic and I think find ways to uh, include um, a much uh, a broader audience in, um, in the development of, of their work. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you everyone for attending. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.